finances, the safety and the health of our loved ones. And therefore, I would like to give you some pointers on how we can take back control and reduce that anxiety. The first thing you can do is to vaccinate because that's one of the most important things we can do to make sure that our immune system is able to respond and protect us against serious COVID infection. What you can also do is to keep your immune system healthy so you can exercise, drink enough fluids, stay away from alcohol and from substances of abuse, and get enough sleep and spend time with your loved ones instead of looking at social media and the TV with all its negative, um, overwhelming information that we're getting and all the false information we're getting. And then lastly, if you are struggling with depression, anxiety, distress, grief or sleeplessness, there are people that can help you. You can contact a psycholo psychological counsellor, a clinical psychologist or a psychiatrist or you can visit your doctor because mental health matters and mental health problems can be treated. Remember, love protects. Do your part and please vaccinate. Thank you. So thank you and uh, welcome to the Love Protects Conversations with our panel of experts. Um, I'm very excited for a number of reasons. The first reason I'm excited is because of the quality of the experts around the table and the ones who will be joining in online. The second reason I'm excited is because we're going to change the format. You'll notice that today we are focusing on everything you need to know because there is so much information about COVID, it's all over the place. And we want to address almost all the topics that we saw are important because now a lot of the questions are becoming repetitive and we'll start playing clips on our Facebook platforms of the relevant issues that have already been addressed as opposed to having weekly engagements that keep on talking about the same issues. What I'd also like to say is in the last four or five weeks, we've really gone through all of the topics. Um, I remember Dr. Bruvet was our, our first guest when we spoke about COVID, its impact, vaccines. We had one on long COVID. We had one on mental health where Dr. Belinda Bruvet was a specialist psychiatrist also, was also present. We've had one, we're having the one today with all of the information. So, so thank you and welcome. Um, th thank you and welcome to this chat. We are going to go through a, a review of what has been done. And once we go through that review, I will be introducing each guest. And then we've also got a special guest who will be dialing in from overseas and who has a special message for Namibians regarding COVID. So I think if, the, if that review has already been done, I'm not sure if it played on the screen or not. I'm going to start introducing our, our guests. At my far right, we've got a specialist psychologist psychiatrist, yeah. Dr. Kisa Mwambene, who is going to talk about our mental health considerations. Then we've got Frederico Lynx. He's the editor of Namibia Fact Check. And I really just want to thank you for the incredible work that you're doing, Frederico, because we rely a lot on that when we are faced with people who are spreading um, misinformation. Then we've got Mrs. Alka Batia, who is the UNDP representative to Namibia. She'll also be talking about vaccines. Many of you by now know Dr. Vili Bruvet. He's a, a specialist physician. He's a pulmonologist. He always says, just say I'm a lung specialist. Um, and he's really been on the front lines of the COVID response, obviously because of his speci speciality. Um, welcome, Dr. Bruvet. And then we've got Dr. Gordon Cupido, who is the head of Department of Internal Medicine at the Karatura Hospital. He's also a physician um, and an infectious disease specialist. And that's why I say I'm so excited about the quality of panelists. Online, we have Dr. Nelaro Amarulu, who's the medical superintendent at the Karatura Hospital, but she's also an obstetrician and a gynecologist. And most excitingly, we've also got Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, who is the WHO chief scientist. And it's fantastic to have her apply her formidable brain to the Namibian specific issue. And ha she has a special message for Namibians. And we're very, very grateful to um, Sheila Rousseau and our colleagues from WHO Namibia who facilitated this exceptional intervention from uh, Dr. Swaminathan, who's the global WHO vaccine specialist. 
So I think we're going to lead straight into the video from the WHO scientist. Greetings from the World Health Organization. I'm Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, the chief scientist, and it gives me great pleasure to be with you today. And my special thanks to the First Lady, Madame Monica Gingos, for inviting me to participate in this uh, wonderful dialogue called Love Protects. I think it's such a wonderful theme because this COVID pandemic has taught us one thing, and that is that we're all in it together. Whichever country or race or creed or religion or ethnicity we belong to, the virus impacts us as human beings and therefore we need to respond as one. I just want to, first of all, you know, express my empathy and solidarity with the people of Namibia who are going through a difficult phase. And you're not alone. Many, many countries in the world, in different regions of the world, in fact, WHO has observed that in five out of our six WHO regions, cases are increasing and many countries are facing third waves, fourth waves. And that's because of a few reasons. The first one is that we have this new variant, the Delta variant of this virus. As we all know, this virus is very clever. It keeps on mutating and changing itself. It keeps evolving because it wants to get fitter. It wants to become stronger and more transmissible. And this Delta variant is definitely more infectious than the previous ones. So previously, if one infected person could infect two or three people. Now, one infected person can infect eight people. And this is why the virus is spreading so rapidly. It's spreading through families and communities and why it's so important for us to be even more careful and take all the precautions that you're, we know help. So maintaining a distance from another person of at least three feet really helps. Having a face covering, a mask on, which covers the nose and mouth properly. And if everyone wears that, you know, it can have a huge impact. And one thing I'd like to say is that till you get the vaccine into your arm, the mask is the best vaccine that you have. So please keep masks on, whether you're coughing or not coughing or you feel perfectly well, even if you're vaccinated, please do keep your masks on, especially when you're with a lot of other people, especially when you're indoors with poor ventilation and especially if you cannot maintain that distancing. We know that in many countries that people cannot maintain physical distancing because of the way in which we live and in the way in which we, our societies are constructed. So mask can help protect us and it can be ordinary cloth mask. It has to be clean, it should be washed and it should be handled uh, carefully, not soiled, you know, not thrown here or there and certainly no exchange of masks between people. So we all need to do that because the Delta variant will find every opportunity really to uh, infect us if we allow it to. Secondly, it's the adherence to these measures. You know, we're all tired. Uh, we've been doing this for more than a year and a half now. And it's very difficult to continue to adhere to these measures. But please, we need to for some more time. If you're feeling well, please don't go out, stay at home, get tested, and stay, try to stay isolated as much as possible for the first uh, week to 10 days. And we know it's a respiratory virus. That's how it spreads. So we have to make sure that we have good ventilation in our homes, keep the doors and windows open, and any meetings that need to be held, uh, have them outdoors where you can be a little more spaced out and where there's fresh air, which um, is, is much better than being indoors with a lot of people, especially in a confined setting. The third reason are the public health and social measures. Many governments, you know, have had to relax them because of economic compulsions. So we need to find a balance between having those regulations and rules in place where we are trying to avoid people from mixing. Certainly, mass gatherings should be avoided and any um, activities which are not essential activities should be avoided at this stage because Namibia is going through currently a crisis with a huge increase in cases compared to the population. We find that the numbers 
of cases are increasing and when the numbers increase, deaths will also increase unfortunately because health systems get completely overwhelmed and there's only so much that doctors and nurses can do and there's only so much place in the hospitals and in the ICUs and there's only so, much, so many oxygen cylinders, ventilators, etc. available. So we need to make sure we're not filling up the hospitals. One thing we've seen is that in countries like Namibia, majority of people who are infected are young. So they're between 20 and 49 years of age. And that's a good thing in a way because young people are less likely to get ill. And data that we've seen from many African countries suggests that a lot of people have been infected without knowing that they've been infected. So that's good that African population is young, so it's relatively less likely, but young people also get ill, they end up in the hospital and can get into very severe uh, disease. So it's best to be very, very careful. And, and finally, it's about vaccination. That's what's going to pr protect us in the long run. It's wonderful that we have so many vaccines that are um, so effective and safe at uh, preventing uh, COVID severe disease and infection. So vaccines will help countries, communities, people, all of us to come out of this pandemic. We need to speed up vaccination as much as possible. I know that the government is doing everything it can to increase a vaccination, but people need to do their bit as well. So everybody who's eligible and everybody who can get a vaccine must get it and must get the complete course. So the two dose vaccine course means that you must go back and get your second dose whenever the government is asking you to come back and get your second dose and that will protect you. Even if you get the infection, you're not going to get ill, you're less likely to spread it to others. So it's good for you, it's good for your family members and your loved ones and it's good for the community. So with those few messages and, and words, I, I want to wish you all strength and courage and uh, I hope that Namibia comes out of this situation quickly, but it really needs the cooperation of everyone and the ability to work together. Thank you so much in solidarity with you. Bye-bye. So we really appreciate the solidarity of Dr. Swabinathan and the WHO for what we're currently going through in relation to our third term. It was fantastic to hear observations, particularly on young people. But it's also going to be fantastic to hear the observations of this incredible panel of experts. And each one is going to take about three minutes to just go through what their professional observations have been. I can see... Um, Dr. Kubido is looking away and hoping that I don't uh, start with him. So, Dr. Kubido, I, I read your, your <laughs> cue. <laughs> so, I'll start on my um, right-hand side with Dr. Mwambene, um, and then we'll go through this way. Just a, a highlight of your key observations. Okay. Uh, generally, I can say um, with COVID-19, when it comes now to issue of... Uh, uh, mental well-being of individuals. And there is a lot of, uh, of fear, a lot of worries when it comes now to uh, COVID-19. So this has created a lot of anxieties within our communities. There is a lot of fear when it comes to um, fear of getting the infection. And then uh, because of that, people, they have a lot of anxiety. And when it comes now to anxiety, because there's a stress, they develop anxiety. This lead now to weakening the immune system. And by doing that, now it made this somebody um, more prone or more vulnerable now to get the infection. And also for those who have already got infection, there was a fear of dying, fear of death, fear of leaving the loved one, except, uh, especially the children, the spouse, the, the, the parents, you know. So this fear also uh, create anxiety. And this anxiety, as I said earlier, it's keep on weakening the immune system. And by doing so, then it's complicates even the, the outcome of the disease. And some, they, 
can have overlap of the symptoms. When now they develop, they develop a full-blown anxiety. Anxiety is a mental disorder, but it has the symptoms that mimic the physical disorders. And overlap of these symptoms really complicate the picture of the, the COVID now to the patient who is now suffering from the COVID. Like the symptoms like uh, anxiety can have symptoms like a headache, which COVID also has headache. Anxiety can have symptoms of uh, chest pain chest tightness, shortness of breath, which also COVID has all those symptoms. Anxiety can have symptoms of general body weakness, which also anxiety have those symptoms. So you find that the more anxious they are, they, they go into developing now a full blown of anxiety. Now they have also the really physical condition, which is COVID. Now the symptoms overlap and this complicate the picture of the COVID-19 and keep on weakening the immune system and lead to poor progress of the disease. Thank you. And um, the, 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 the relationship between anxiety, fear and COVID is fascinating. So thank you for sharing that. And we'll move to Federico Links, who's the editor of Namibia Fact Check. And he's going to take us through his high level observations about the trends that he's noticing on misinformation. Yeah. And, and I, I think I'll, I'll sort of uh, use as an entry point to hold anxiety and fear um, um, uh, issue. I mean, that's exactly what is driving um, a lot of the disinformation and the misinformation around um, uh, around COVID-19, around the vaccines at the moment. Um, and that's what the disinformation, these, the, the people who create this sort of content, that, that's what they count in the anti-vaxxer movements and, and, and so on. Um, and I mean, it was anxiety and fear. If you remember the young woman in office Bay early last year who mm -hmm. committed suicide because of mm -hmm. the, the, the conspiracy theory that 5G um, was causing COVID-19 and she thought this tower outside her window was a 5G tower even though we don't have 5G technology in Namibia at the moment. Um, and then she committed suicide. Now, I mean, there was mental illness, uh, I think a history of mental illness mm -hmm. there, but it was also anxiety that, that, uh, that fed her, 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 her mental illness being cooped up as it was the early part of our, um, th that first lockdown and so on. Um, and, and, and really what, how we can lessen um, anxiety and fear. I mean, uh, the, Dr. Brevet who, who spoke in that opening clip um, very aptly pointed out, you know, for a lot of us, the information overload is, mm. is, is problematic. Yeah. So we need really to switch off, to step away from, from, from social media. But people aren't doing that. People are doom scrolling, what, what they call doom scrolling. You're, you're always on your social media feeds and you're always encountering this information. It's confusing. It's, it's what the, the World Health Organization um, labeled the, the, the infodemic in February last year already, when, when we already started seeing this flood, this tide of information, a lot of it confusing, a lot of it true, a lot of it false. Um, accompanying the pandemic as it, as it w went global mm. um, um, around the beginning of last year, sort of from January, February, it started going global out of, out of China. Um, and and this, this as the pandemic went, so did the, this flood of, of information. And then in, in July last year, the, um, it, it reached such a, such a critical point that uh, UNESCO dubbed it the, the disinfodemic. Because a lot of what we were seeing at that stage around uh, the pandemic was just falsehoods, um, uh, disinformation. The, the information space, the COVID-19 information space had become so polluted um, that it, it, it has, at this stage, become so hard for people to discern um, between what is true and what is false. Um, and, and I mean, at that point, um, we started talking about how do we how do we address this? Uh, not just you know within the disinformation research space, within the, the fact-checking community, the global fact-checking community. Um, how do we address this? And I mean, it's clear that I mean fact-checking can only go so far. Yeah. Um, health communication really needs to step into the space, um, and and global health authorities largely missed the step there. Um, local health authorities largely missed that, th that opportunity. Um, and I mean, my takeaway at the end of the day is that we need health authorities, we need governments to, to step into this information space when we have 
emergencies, crises such as health emergencies, such as the COVID-19 health emergency, um, with, uh, with comprehensive information. The information has to be clear. It has to be consistent, the messaging, and, and it has to be continuous. So we, 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 we need to step into this space, um, you know, communicating consistently, clearly, comprehensively about the facts of what's happening, um, what the interventions are, why we have these interventions. There needs to be a great deal of transparency around what's happening. And I think this is the lesson that comes out of this um, going forward. If we find ourselves in a situation like this again, that we actually are informationally and communicationally prepared to deal with the emergency because this has become not just a health crisis, it's a communication crisis. It's a trust crisis which has developed from the communication crisis. It's a trust crisis in health authorities, in governments, um, in authoritative sources of any kind. Um, and, and that's what the situation COVID-19 has now become. People don't believe anybody anymore. You know. and, and I think you have a valid point. I think we've got a, a number of pandemics but the, the, the disinformation, the trust levels, the communication mm. crises and reactions um, are teaching us lessons for the future of how to deal with um, crises. Um, but at least there's a vaccine for COVID-19, but there's no vaccine for um, disinformation. And maybe what the vaccine you're proposing is more proactive and consistent engagement of um, filling these gaps of information that people fill with misinformation and disinformation. And that leads us to uh, Mrs. Batia, the UNDP um, representative to Namibia, who's going to speak to us on a high level basis about vaccines, um, about the effectiveness and all the questions that are coming um, around vaccines. And also just what are the key points that you'd like to highlight from the get go? Thank you. And um, a lot of what I would have said was already said by uh, Dr. Swami Nathan. And, and I mean, this is a message uh, which I think bears repeating all the time. That firstly, vaccines are very critical in building your immunity to the virus. And vaccines are not something new. I mean, people are treating it. We've been vaccinated from childhood, right? We've been, managed to eradicate such severe diseases like polio and smallpox, et cetera, with vaccines. So this is not something. And from birth, you are given, you're, you're, you're always given a vaccine. So it, it becomes a little bit um, confusing or bewildering to understand why people are so hesitant to take something which, is, which builds your immunity, which, uh, which, uh, which is so safe, which is effective, which prevents serious illness and death. And very importantly, this vaccine, if you are vaccinated, you will not only protect yourself, but all your loved ones as well, right? You are not transmitting any of the virus. You, you put a stop uh, to, to, to the virus uh, going ahead. And this is why the, there is, I mean, medical science has made such amazing advances we have this medical research technologies, we have different vaccines and all of these vaccines are considered safe. No matter, it's not one over the other. The best is whichever vaccine is available, go get that. And, and just coming back from you in terms of the infodemic and the misinformation, exactly. Why would you, I mean, I, I question it like that. Why would anybody not want to protect his or her life and that of his loved ones. Why would you deliberately go in the face of these uh, uh, validated factual statements which are being made? Why, it, it, why is that, that fear again? And, the, and that probably is, comes up from your point in terms of providing that information. If whoever wants to know something, go to the exact source, get that correct information, and then let's take it from there. And that's how we come in also, because it's, it's about first and foremost, it's about protecting your lives and the livelihoods. You cannot continue with your livelihood. You cannot continue with your daily activities. If you are unwell or you're effect, uh, infected or you, I mean, it, it, you develop that uh, kind of a weakness. So the vaccines are the ones 
which will inject that memory. I mean, there is a, I'm not a doctor in that sense to do that, but this is the way it put, uh, starts your immune system, develops that memory in your cells to fight off the virus and therefore halt the spread of the virus. So I, that's how we are coming into the picture yes. in terms of how we can do our part in spreading correct information, in, in supporting people to do the right thing. And that's the paradox. There's something that's causing fear and anxiety. Yes. The vaccine is a clear path out of that fear, anxiety, and destruction being called by, caused by the virus. But because of the trust deficit, <laughs> we don't trust the vaccine, which is the only solution. So, so that's a quick summary of, of where we are as people. And luckily, we've got the frontliners here who deal with the patients, with the consequences. Um, so Dr. Brevet, maybe you've got some points you'd like to add. No, I think, I mean, if we look wh wh where we've come from, um, from the start in, what's it, March last year, where we had our first cases, um, for initially hoping that we would be able to curb the spread and, and protect our community to the current wave where we're seeing the, the massively high numbers of patients being admitted, um, the frustration of having patients outside that you can't get into a hospital, yeah. And, and the high numbers of deaths, it, 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 as a, as a frontline worker, I think it was, it's a difficult period for, for all of us. And then also adding on that, um, the frustration of the misinformation that we're sitting with and the, the fact that we, we have a preventative measure in that we can vaccinate. Um, I mean, we've come from where our initial aim was to slow the spread, to flatten the curves for two reasons. One, to protect our healthcare system and also to buy time so that we can get something yeah. like a vaccine. And, and initially we were so effective in that and we were, were flattening the curve and we were slowing the spread. And then unfortunately we somehow dropped the ball as a, as a community. And then we sit with this, this rampant community spread and, and the, the death that's um, affecting us all. I mean, all our, um, everybody knows knows somebody uh, lost a loved one, um, and it's it's difficult. And I think um, we have to look at ways that we can can improve our current situation and um, prevent it from happening in future. Because I think we have to look forward and say, how can we improve? Um, I also think as a as a clinician, it was a, a rapid learning curve. I mean, from what we knew a year ago to what we know now. There's been so much additional information that we, that we, um, that, that research pr produced and, and provided us with. So I think we know much more and we know we're going to learn a lot more, but we have to um, trust the science. We have to listen to the, the experts that, that works with, with this and, and um, yeah, follow the guidelines. We have to trust the science. We must listen to the experts. And luckily we have so many around us um, and Dr. Cupido is an is a absolute expert in infectious diseases um, and we'd like to hear your views. Yeah, so I think I have made three main sort of considerations. The one is that we have to realize that this epidemic has really hit us very, very hard. You know, we've lost a lot of people. We are going to continue to lose people. Um, we're talking about breadwinners, we're talking about heads of families, um, heads, leaders in the community, educated people, people who are supposed to take this country forward, who have now died before their time. And the loss is not going to be easily um, remedied. And if there's a fourth wave coming, we're going to lose more people and with the fifth and on and on. So we really have to find a way out of this. We can't lock down the country every six months. Our only way out is a vaccine. And for people who are not prepared to face that reality, are going to lock us into a perpetual cycle of loss, destruction, and eventually disintegration. We can see what's happening in South Africa. It is accumulation of death, 
of financial hardship and of a loss of faith in the authorities because they can't stop the cycle of death. So if we don't want to go on that road, we need to, as the colleagues have said, we need to embrace the science. So that's the first thing that strikes me. The second is looking at um, our society as a whole. You know, we've had the 10%, 90%, if you are well off, if you have a medical aid, if you have private security, then you are secured from the misery which afflicts the population. And COVID has uh, um, upset those calculations. When the private hospitals are full, patients with medical aid have to come to the state. And that tells you in any country when the chips are down, it's the state which has to, to step in. So we all invested in a functioning society and a functional state. Nobody, no amount of money buys you out of living in a society which must be just, which must be equitable, and which must look after the poorest. And I think the Namibians have woken up to the reality mm -hmm that we are one people, we are living in one country, and we need to look after each other. And the third thing is maybe just for me to pay homage to my colleagues who um, are in the front line. Um, we've lost colleagues, mm. uh, um, young colleagues, to this, and in spite of this, they go to work every day um, facing these circumstances. So I think, you know, a lot of strength has been found in our society. A lot of people have, have taken the baton and we've realized that the strength in our society comes from the young. It comes from these young doctors and young nurses on the front line. And these are the people whom we must look to in the future. Yeah. I think we must stop celebrating the old. We must invest in the young if we want to move forward as a country. Thank you, Dr. Kubido. But you say something that's important, that um, we can't continue with a cycle of lockdowns every six months. Um, the two of you see what's happening um, in the hospitals. Um, our psychiatrist knows what's happening in our homes, and I'm sure Frederico is is upset about the level of uh, disinformation as, as, as Alka would be. But one thing you said is what, what's going to take us through this, what's going to stop the suffering, and everybody has said that, is vaccine. But because we don't trust each other, we are resisting the only solution. And I know that uh, Honorable McHenry Vanani, the president of the PDM, he made a very strong appeal last week for people to vaccinate. He himself had COVID. And I was, I, was, I was happy to see that because if we're not going to unite across political lines, across racial lines, across ethnic lines, across religious lines, um, and, and, and fight this common enemy, we've, we've, we can always fight each other later, but this enemy will defeat all of us. So I think the message that is coming here is if COVID is not going to unite us. There will be nothing to fight over in two years' time. So, so that is what the experts are saying, and the experts are saying what this conversation is about, that it's about love protects, and each of us have to do our part. And with those words, I'm going to transfer to Blanche, because this is an interactive session. We do have people who've asked questions on our respective platforms and Blanche will be going through those questions and allocating those questions to the respective panel members. All right then. Thank you so much, Madam Flon. Uh, good evening, esteemed panelists. Uh, yeah, we do have questions from the uh, Twitter and Facebook timelines of uh, the Office of the First Lady as well as the NBC pages. So the first question I will direct to Ms. Uh, Batia. Uh, it's from Sylvia Johannes Simasiku and she wants to know, she's following, and as well as Jimmy Kambwa. 
they are following on the vaccine and about the immunity that is being provided by the vaccines. So related to this, they want to know there seems to be in an impression that there are quote unquote better vaccines than the ones available that people would rather wait for. What is your advice to that? <laughs> All vaccines are good because they are safe, they are effective, they prevent serious illness, and they prevent death. So the best vaccine is the one which is right there for you to go and get that. And these are vaccines are done with different technologies, etc. but they all go through a very um, rigorous trial right or, or several trials right we, we there are all these first phase second phase third phase trials and after that they are provided the approvals uh, the who provides their um, uh, eul or the emergency use listing and after it provides that they are rolled out all the vaccines have been done uh, that way at that level and with each country also there are additional checks and balances. Nobody wants to put their populations at risk. So these vaccines, there is no better vaccine. So whichever one you can get your hands on, it's also about now that accessibility and availability of these vaccines. If we are fortunate enough in this country to get vaccines, and I think the government needs to be commended because they are at considerable expense, these uh, vaccines are being procured and rolled out for free. So we should really not hesitate to go for a vaccine. It's a, it's a shot of hope. The vaccine is a shot of hope. And as uh, Flon just said, it's, it's, our, it's not only our individual responsibility, but it's a collective responsibility to ourselves, our family, our community, our country, and the world at large. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Bhatia. Dr. Bruve, the second question is from Luel Gabriel, who posted on Facebook. He shared his observation that two cases where individuals who received both doses of Sinopharm vaccine got the virus and later died. Uh, further questioning, is there a link between the current vaccination program and the sudden high number of deaths? Yeah, sure. Um, I think one has to understand that the aim of the vaccine is not only to prevent you from getting sick. It's preventing, it's trying to prevent hospitalizations and severe disease and even death. Now, unfortunately, not all individuals' immunity works the same way. Some people will not um, have, I mean, we, we won't have a vaccine that is 100% effective. Mm -hmm. There's no there's no drug that we have that is 100% effective. What we know from, from our research in, in the vaccinations are that they, that they are highly effective in pre preventing severe disease. I mean, and I'm talking about 99% plus in, if, in preventing death um, in, in some, some studies. So I think one has, to, one has to just take a step back and understand that vaccines aren't there to, um, to prevent the disease. Although they do, you still can get it, but it, it, the aim is to lessen the severity of the disease. Mm. Um, as to the question of um, the association between the vaccine rollout and the, the peak that we're experiencing now, I think that is also based on, on misinformation that, we've, that we have in, on social media. I mean, there's so few of us that's actually been vaccinated fully that, you, that, that, that few numbers co can't nearly have that impact on, on our society. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's a misunderstanding of how vaccines work that brings this, this information into the public domain that, that spreads misinformation with regards to how vaccines work and the impact that they might have on, on um, the disease severity. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Langs, I know you have spoken about it in your introductory remarks about the rumors, but then this person still wants to know with the rumor of Namibia experiencing high deaths because of vaccines is becoming prevalent. Where do these rumors originate from? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, if you look at um, 
you know, a lot of these, uh, uh, these, uh, these narratives, the death narrative and so on, um, the, these are sort of, these come out of the anti-vaxxer uh, anti community, anti-vaccination um, community, which, which is globalized with, with the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and the, the, the anti-vaccine narratives have been coming on since the beginning of this, of, of, of I mean, this isn't new. Um, a lot of these, um, uh, these, uh, uh, these falsehoods emanate from right from the beginning of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And they've just been recirculating and become uh, uh, viral again as the vaccine rollout has started since the end of last year in various parts of the world. And so have the death claims. Um, um, 5,000 and something deaths in the US uh, are reported. Um, but if you look at what the US CDC says about these deaths, I mean, none of them have been linked to any of the vaccines. We've had uh, claims about deaths in, in other parts of the world. We've now, we now um, have uh, um, um, figures here in Namibia uh, with large followings on social media um, claiming that um, people are dying because of the vaccines. But the numbers don't bear that out if you look mm -hmm. at the numbers. I mean, um, 130,000 people uh, um, vaccinated. We've got 2,000 something deaths. None of the deaths linked to at this point in time to the vaccines. So, so there's no massive die off taking place in this country of people vaccinated. Uh, 130,000 people, you know, is um, we do see the deaths of people who've been vaccinated, but as Dr. Prouvere said, I mean, there are factors there that play a role in those, in those deaths. If you look at some of them, somebody who's 73 years old, comorbidities, you know, under, underlying health problems. Um, so you're looking at somebody with an immune system which is severely compromised. Um, and, and this person, there isn't much a vaccine is going to do for somebody like that. You know, the vaccine is supposed to help your immune system, but when, when you're... you're, you're with age, our, our immune systems deteriorate. So, and, and, and now you've got diseases and, and, and illnesses on top of that. So, you know, people, you know, these things are so, if you just step back and take a look at these things, you sort of realize what's happening. Um, but, um, you know, a lot of this, uh, uh, these, this death narrative um, comes from uh, uh, this internationalized anti-vaccine um, uh, movement. And, and it's disturbing that, that people are so quick to believe, you know, yeah. just anonymous <laughs> posts, voice notes, uh, um, posts on, 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 especially WhatsApp. I mean, WhatsApp has just become totally polluted. Um, and, um, you know, you, you don't know how to, how to get people away from it. I mean, I'm, as, as a fact checker, as somebody who, who tries to, to, to share um, factual information on, on the various social media platforms that um, as, as an initiative that we operate on. It, it, you know, it, it's disheartening. It's, it's disappointing to see a lot of this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and certainly it's not, a, it's not true. Mm -hmm. you know, you don't, we don't see the die-offs. We don't see the mass deaths that people are claiming. And I mean, I just, I, I think I'm taking too long, but I just want to point out something. You know, if you, if you look at these claims, so they were supposed to be when, when we started the vaccination process in March, this, this drive, the claim was from one of these people who were sharing this, uh, spreading around this information. Um, people don't take it at Karatura Hospital. A lot of the people there now dying are, are, are people who've been vaccinated. Um, and then the, the people who have been who were vaccinated didn't die off in, in these mm. massive numbers. Now it's become, you know, if uh, the people who, who are vaccinated will die in two years. Mm. And, and now even, I mean, I've now also seen, you know, where the, the people who, who, who got vaccinated will die in five years. Mm -hmm. So the lie keeps, mm. is being adapted okay. because yeah. it's not happening what these people are saying. The lie is being adapted to, to fit it's the circumstances. There weren't mass deaths when people were vaccinated. So now we have to adapt the lie to say people will die in two years time. People will die in five years time. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, people need to be aware of this. This is what's busy happening. This is disinformation. It's being adapted. It's being, uh, 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 um, you know, sort of a uh, uh, fit to, to, to the circumstances. But people keep on falling for it, yeah. Yeah. Which, is, which is where the question mark for me is. Why do people keep on falling for mm. this sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you spoke about the WhatsApp groups. Uh, Dr. Mwambene, 
This person wants to know or first stated that fake news is also starting to affect uh, people's relationships. So how can we stop our loved ones from posting fake news and pushing misinformation in, onto family WhatsApp groups as it always starts arguments? Okay, thank you for the question. I think uh, my fellow panelists have spoken a lot about the misinformation. And this is true uh, in the media and especially in the WhatsApp group as if the question is uh, directed. A lot of misinformation have been circulating in there. And this inf misinformation, uh, it started when the, the, the pandemic started. Uh, so there, is a mis there was a misinformation about the, the coronavirus and now there's a lot of misinformation about the, the COVID-19 and a lot of misinformation about the vaccination against now uh, coronavirus. So with the coronavirus, they talk about a lot like uh, it has been made, it is the, the target is to decrease um, population in the world and especially to kill a lot of Africans. So this circulated that way. And when it comes now to COVID-19 uh, disease also, uh, COVID-19, a lot of misinformation now, it was like, this is not the really disease. It's something that has been made. So this fear and fake information about that affect a lot of people. And especially so those people who have got uh, less access to the real information or the factual information are the majority that are really affected with whatever little they get from the WhatsApp media. Uh, and now like uh, with the vaccine, as my fellow panelists have already said, they are talking about if you va you are, you'll be vaccinated against uh, coronavirus, your body will turn into magnet. I remember when I was vaccinated, uh, my colleague came and then started to put a coin at my, <laughs> at my shoulder there where I was vaccinated. Then I was like, what? I didn't know what is going yeah. on. They said, no, you've heard that if you are vaccinated, then your body will turn into magnet. Then I was, no, this is not the way. So what I can advise about the fake, fake news, um, people, let's uh, try to protect our mind. Let's try to look to the, to the facts about coronavirus, yeah. the facts about COVID-19, the facts about vaccination. So if you can, we can not get the facts by ourselves, by reading, let's go and ask those people who knows, or try to find the, the reliable source, like a reliable WHO source, a reliable health uh, professionals, a reliable people who really knows about the whole issues about COVID-19. And also when you read, or when you start reading, um, the messages, the fake messages that have been forwarded through media. First of all, if you start realizing that this might not be true, don't continue reading it. Doctor, can I quickly and ask then, a question? Then? Yes. What if I'm that person? I'm your sister or I'm your mother. I'm in the family WhatsApp group, but I'm the one who keeps on putting that information because I believe it. What, what would you advise or how would you handle me in a way that our relationship doesn't break? Okay. How would you manage me? Okay. First of all, I would, it's true that this is going on there. So the most important thing is I, I'll advise that sister of mine or a friend or whoever sent that information in the media that please don't send if you're not so sure about that information. And that's why now I was insisting now you have to be sure that that's what you are saying you are sending to someone else. It's the fact. If you're not so sure, please don't send because it will create a lot of, of fear among people. And it's better to delete, delete immediately. Don't even continue reading yourself because it also affects yourself. The sender and the receiver are really affected with the fake news. So let's avoid doing that. And the other thing also for, for us, let's have this practice of not trying to read a lot about COVID-19 because it's really also confusing. We can limit our our exposure to information about COVID-19 through media. Uh, mentally, I would like we advise that for a mental well-being, at least limit for two th or three times per week and have a specific time of a day that you can read. Maybe lunchtime you can go quick and say, what are the facts, what are the new things, that the facts information. So you limit yourself. Limit yourself towards um, the end of the day because some of the people, they develop now problem of sleeping because of reading the information that is really confusing. Mm -hmm. So let's abide of that. Let us limit ourselves uh, on the time that we are um, focusing or exposing ourselves to the information about COVID, which is not factual. And let's try to 
be more, uh, try to find out what are the really facts about the COVID-19. If you don't know, you better ask. Yeah. If you're not so sure, please don't forward the information. And especially for those, especially our parents, our old patients, who they don't know. They can trust. If the child go to the parents, send the information, tell them about the COVID-19, and the parents, they don't have much exposure about the factual information about COVID-19, this really will affect. So let's try to practice this. Don't forward any information. We are tempted to forward, but please they not forward all the information that you get from your cell phone or your Instagram or where. Don't forward. Forward only the information that you are sure of. It's better to ask to be sure before, before you forward or before you communicate the information with the loved one. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kubido. Ronial Van Beek on Facebook wants to know uh, what can we do to strengthen our bodies before taking the jab, especially when dealing with underlying um, factors? So, if one has a specific immunosuppressive illness, let's say you're on um, medication that depresses the immune system, then it's probably best to have your health practitioner advise you as to how to optimize that treatment regimen for you to be able to, um, to respond to the vaccine. The vaccine itself is safe, and the vaccine itself will not cause disease in 99 point plus patients who receive it. So the question should be, how do I maximize, I suppose, my response to? Now, I think in two parts. One is in the time of that we are now, in a third wave, probably one should get the vaccine without delay because the risk of optimizing yourself prior to the vaccine is outweighed by the chance that you will get the virus before you get the vaccine. So if you haven't had the vaccine and if you have an opportunity to get the vaccine, then I would say unless you've got really urgent health concerns, you should get the vaccine ASAP. In terms of optimizing prior, do the things that you would normal that you normally should do. Stop smoking, lose weight, stop taking alcohol, and try to make sure that your blood pressure, your sugar, all of those things are well controlled. Okay, but there you. is no reason not to attack, take the vaccine. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Doctor Brewer, there's a brief question here for you, As, I, again from the same question, person. I'm due for my second shot of AstraZeneca. Will the vaccine still work if I get the shot later than, than the date scheduled? Um, yeah, the short answer is yes, it, it will work. Um, and fortunately with, with AstraZeneca, we actually know if we delay, if there is a delay in the um, administration of your second dose, if the, that interval is longer, it actually works better. So it's not a... Not a um, necessarily a bad thing to delay it by a few weeks. Yeah. Um, so yes, the, the vaccine will still work. Okay. Sinopharm? Sinopharm, we don't know. We don't have as much information on, on specifically the, the, the delay. Probably it will still work. Um, it's a, remember, Sinopharm is a, um, is a dead virus. It's an inactivated virus. So um, giving it two weeks later or three weeks later shouldn't, but with AstraZeneca at least, we do know that the delay is actually beneficial. So as, as with Sinopharm, we don't have that data, but probably it will, will still, um, still be effective. And that was important because um, the Sinopharm lands on Saturday, so I don't think people are too much out yeah. of the, the time frame. And then we were told this morning by the Minister of Health that they expect AstraZeneca um, towards the end of next week, or at least within the next two weeks. So it's, it's good to hear mm -hmm. that it actually improves the response, even if it's delayed. Because I know many people are concerned Concern. it might have a, yeah. a detrimental effect, and what you're saying is the opposite is true. Yeah. It has a positive effect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right then. Dr. Kubido, the question is on the increasing number of home deaths. What are some of the practical steps that people can follow when a loved one experiences severe disease and is unable to receive medical care in a hospital? So that's, that's a bit of a difficult one because but severe disease by definition means you should be treated in a hospital. 
I think uh, what people should try to preempt um, someone deteriorating to the point that they need emergency admission. In other words, so particularly people who are at risk for developing severe disease and who develop symptoms or have had a positive contact should be, um, should be monitored closely. If one can afford a, um, an oxygen um, measuring probe, then that is probably the best case. And this is uh, something which you can buy at pharmacies. You place it on your finger and it actually measures the amount of oxygen in your blood. The normal value would be above 94%, but acceptable above 90%. So this is one thing that you could do. But the second thing is, I think, if somebody starts experiencing shortness of breath on walking, that is already a sign that that person is not well. Um, that is as far as the, as the lungs goes. So I think three things. If someone's at risk for development of disease, monitor them closely. If you can buy a, what we call a pulse oximeter, then do so. But if you can't, then I think, um, and the person starts developing shortness of breath, on, on, on walking or on daily activities, take that person to a health facility. Do not try to manage severe COVID at home. Don't try to steam. Don't try unauthorized medications. Yeah. I'm speaking about ivermectin <laughs> because we have seen multiple patients who have left it too late because they place their trust in this kind of um, unauthorized completely unvalidated medication and they come to hospital late and these are the people who have unfortunately many of them die either at home or on the way to the hospital. Can I just extend that question? If somebody does die at home, what are the next practical steps that the family must make? Because we're seeing more and more home deaths. What happens after somebody dies at home and not in a hospital? So I think the I mentioned that question is what is the risk to the, um, to the people of moving or manipulating the body. And the second is, of course, that the death must be notified and the people who come to remove the body should be um, informed that this you know, could be a COVID-related death, although we now take those precautions automatically. So the risk to the... Um, you know, in terms of manipulating, moving the body, um, is probably highest in the initial period, particularly since the surfaces around the body may be contaminated, and particularly since any movement may change the pressure within the chest and cause the person to, even a dead person, you know, can expel active and live virus. So the people who intend to move the body should be should protect themselves body covering mask should try to um, and of course gloves and um, i think minimal movement of the body and inform the authorities as, as, as soon as possible mm -hmm. well um dr kilbido i think it's the second one is also related to the first one but it's from sylvester shimuningeni who wants to know that because of the pandemic, washing, clothing and viewing of the bodies of our loved ones have been compromised, including the manner in which the funerals take place. So now he wants to know uh, how can a corpse in a coffin transmit the virus and also can disinfecting the body ensure everyone's safety? Okay. So how a corpse can, I think we've just discussed this, number one, the surrounding of the body, um, because the person, while they were alive, were shedding virus onto the surfaces. And the second is then, as you said, if you manipulate a dead body and you put pressure on the chest or you manipulate, move the body, then sometimes virus can be expelled. So particularly in that that very early period, you know, as, as the person has passed, that is probably the higher risk. But the highest risk is at the funeral or in the, at the wake when people are congregating 
and many of them will be asymptomatic but will have the virus. So the body is actually a minor part of the problem. The biggest transmission is the mourning process, the wake and the funeral. All right, um, producer Tutu, for us to have a Dr. Amagulu on standby, but while we are getting um, the, the doctor online, I have questions here, who is also for Dr. Muambene. This person wants to know, because of COVID-19 pandemic, more people are experiencing mental health challenges. What are some of the health trends that you have observed, as well as the advice that you can give as a result of the pandemic? Okay, thank you. Uh, what I've observed, um as the mental health trend now because of the COVID-19. Uh, I would like to categorize maybe into three major groups. On the patient trends, on the health care provider strain, as well as on the, in the community. On the patients, I've experienced that uh, post uh, COVID-19, uh, people they've developed um, mental health complications that they didn't have before. Like I've attended two patients who they've developed uh, cognitive uh, impairment, including poor concentration, poor memory. Some have a slowness in the thinking, speech problems post COVID-19. And this has been so, and some of the uh, research that have been done, especially there's one ongoing research uh, in Canada by Vox Neuro, they've confirmed that this is a, a post COVID-19 complication that is now is increasing and the impact is delaying. It can take even one year, two years. Some patients, it can have permanent one, but they say with time, uh, with a proper intervention and um, rehabilitation, they can recover from that. But that is the trend and I've already seen in two patients that I've been attending. And the other thing also on mental health uh, um, impact of COVID-19 that I've also observed, that patients who have developed a new onset of depression and anxiety, which they didn't have before the COVID-19. And this also has been proven that this also is a manifestation of the functional uh, abnormalities of COVID-19, functional brain abnormalities of COVID-19. That the, the imaging of patients who develop a new onset depression, anxiety, also even psychosis, including the, a lot of visual uh, hallucination post COVID-19. So that is the trend also in terms of the, of the patient. As I said earlier, also a lot of the anxieties. And also among children, also I've seen the children with their behavioral problems, uh, behavioral changes, behavioral abnormalities. And I have already even seen a patient, who, a, a child who is 11 years old with a suicidal ideation because of the loss of the parents. You know, now the orphans are increasing. That mm -hmm. one was double, double orphan. Like both parents have died within a period of two weeks. So that boy developed a suicidality, wanted to kill himself because of that loss of the parents. So that's in nutshell, I can say on the patient side. But also on the health care providers, this has been really uh, affected the mental well-being of us health care providers. A lot of uh, nurses and doctors and other health care providers, they have a lot of burnout. They're in a lot of stressful situation. There are other called, call me and crying. They say, doctor, we cannot go on like this anymore. And this is because uh, they've seen, uh, they've been exposed with the a lot of patients who are dying. This is not normal. We know at the hospital patients somehow in a one way or another, they, they were dying. But the trend that is going on now, a lot of patients are dying, which is also, you know, healthcare providers also, they are human beings, they have emotions. So seeing every day patients are dying, they're trying to do their best to save their lives. But at the end of the day, patients are dying. Breaking news uh, to the family mm. for the death of the loved one, this really affecting the healthcare providers. So this also is the trend that I've seen, increasing number of uh, healthcare providers with anxiety. There are other, there's one who came uh, two days ago, came to my office, say, doctor, I want to quit. I don't want to be a doctor anymore. And she was really crying, saying, no, I cannot handle this situation anymore. So this is a trend that has been going on, a lot of burnout among healthcare providers, which really complicates to mm. mental health complications, including depression. And the other trend now in the community, as I said earlier, there's a lot of anxieties in the community and this affects both elder people and the children. There's a lot that is going on among the children uh, with, the, with the lockdown, not going to school, limitation of uh, to go to play, meeting friends. So this also contributed to uh, mental health complication as the trend after uh, 
COVID-19 or going on, on, on with the COVID-19. So my advice now, how to prevent or how to deal with this uh, situation. First of all, what I can say, we have to take care of ourselves. And self-care including both the care of your mind, the care of your mental and the care of your physical, not only like physical well-being, but also your mind. What are you thinking about COVID-19? What are you hearing about COVID-19? What are you believing about COVID-19? We need to purify what we put in our mind and what we believe about the COVID-19 in our mind. And as I said earlier, if you don't know or you are not so sure about COVID-19, you better ask and have the real information which will keep you at least away from, from the fear. But also, uh, I have also to advocate the issue of um, uh, seeking help. Where you think that you cannot handle situation by your own, please seek help whether it's within the family or friend network or professional help. Especially, I have to insist on professional help. I know there's a lot of stigma about mental health or contacting psychologists, psychiatrists, or any mental health provider. But really, during this time of yeah. COVID-19, a lot of people are suffering from uh, mental health complications. And they are keeping to themselves because of this stigma. Please, seek help. Come to us. Um, say what is bothering you so that we can, we can help you. Also, let's learn how to develop the good coping strategies. Let's not cope by using drugs like alcohol or other substances because this will make more harm to our immune system, to our mental well-being, even to our physical health. So the good coping strategies is also very important. At workplace also I can um, uh, insist or I can ask or I can um, requests the managers, the supervisors, whoever is the leader at workplace. Really, let us have concern uh, with the mental well-being of mm -hmm. our staff, eh? uh, our juniors, colleagues. Let's help each other. If you see your colleague at work is not doing so well, let's offer support. And the, the leaders also, when someone feels like he cannot handle, she cannot handle, maybe she suffered a lot uh, from the loss of loved one or there's something that a sick person, Let's offer help and let's try to understand that because the mental well-being at health, uh, workplace is very, very important. And sometimes if you find someone is vulnerable, let's try also to, if it's possible, it's, work, it's applicable at that particular nature of work, let's try to, I cannot say recycle, but at least move from high risk area to lower risk area so that to uh, kind of distressing the situation. Not let now someone who is vulnerable, already experienced stress, cannot handle the situation, also keep on working on a higher risk area. I can also um, give the example, there are some, there's a doctor who was working in a COVID ICU and was really tormented with the situation, the COVID ICU. So at least uh, she came to us, we tried to give, offer the intervention and also we discussed with the supervisor. The supervisor was very understanding. Then she moved from that high risk area to another area that uh, at least she's able now to cope. So these are the things also we need to, to, to consider. And also maybe uh, our healthy diet. Let's consider healthy diet. Let's have this um, healthy lifestyle. Um, exercising, um, sleep hygiene. Sleep is a very, very important. Let's try to have enough rest, which is very good also for our immune system. And I, think that's, I think that's fantastic, fantastic yes. feedback. And these are all very, very practical ways that each individual can yeah. make sure that they look after themselves. Yes. And I think even for pregnant women, and mm -hmm. that's why we're so eager to listen to Dr. Mm -hmm. Amarulu as well. So yeah, Blanche, if yes. you could... Uh, Dr. Amagulu, here are some yeah. questions from uh, our social media pages. Good evening. Yes, Doctor, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you so much for joining in. Uh, here are mm -hmm. questions with regard to how the COVID-19 affects pregnant women. Can mm -hmm. it be transferred from mother to baby? Can they get the... COVID-19 vaccine while pregnant or breastfeeding? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for the question. Um, one, I think um, pregnant women are susceptible to getting COVID-19 as much as non-pregnant uh, women, but um, they, they tend to have a higher risk 
of getting severe COVID. Um, and, and I think that's the, the, the biggest um, uh, concern. Um, but the majority of, of, of pregnant women who will or who may get COVID, uh, more than 90 percent, will, will recover, uh, will do well. But that risk for severe infection and naturally consequently hospitalization is, is, is there. Um, certainly, um, the vaccines have been noted to be quite safe in pregnancy, um, though the data available um, is limited and has really been in um, the obstetric population in America and has been noted much more with women who received the, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines and there have been no issues related to safety uh, or vertical transmission. Um, there's, there's, none has been recorded. There have been a few cases of the virus being picked up in the placenta or the membranes, uh, but questions around whether or not um, the vertical transmission is there for those babies, neonates, that do test positive for um, the virus is around whether or not the baby might have been infected around the uh, delivery. Uh, but certainly we are recommending and advocating for pregnant women to be vaccinated simply because the, the, the risk of, of, of um, uh, severe COVID is, is, is higher in this population. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then... Um the question is, as a health Minister of Health official, uh, Francois Smith wants to know, uh, with the current vaccine shortage in the country, is there anything that can be done to increase vaccine supply, be it from pharmaceutical companies or medical aid companies, or can it only be um, done by government? Mm. Uh, certainly, uh, government is not only uh, the only one that is um, uh, providing. Uh, well, currently, government has been the, 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 the only one providing vaccines. But I think at notice, the public notice went out uh, towards the end of uh, March, I think the 31st of March, that allowed um, wholesalers and distributors to bring in vaccines from reputable um, sources to increase what is available in country and to distribute it. And I think there were guidelines as to uh, these private providers, what they would need to have in place uh, in terms of providing and distributing these vaccines. So the question is, yes, uh, private uh, providers can bring in um, um, vaccines into the country. Uh, and that has, and there's an official notice to that effect. Mm -hmm. And just before I hand over to the first well, lady. Can we skip that and rather give mm -hmm. Dr. Marulu a chance to give her final wrap up about what mm -hmm. her key mm -hmm. points are before we go into everybody else rather than going to another question for her. Mm -hmm. Okay then. And then we can start with her with and then the, move yeah. through the panel. Mm -hmm. Tuan, can you just repeat that question please? So, my, the, my, my. so there was a, a question, but it's already been asked um, around variants. And I think what I'm trying to get right, Dr. Marulu, is we're going to start wrapping up and I'm going to give every panelist two minutes just to wrap yeah. up the high points. And I'd really like to start with you. Mm -hmm. uh, my high points really are pregnant women, because I'm an obstetrician, um, should get vaccinated. Uh, obviously, we want to maximize immunity. Um, uh, simply because this group, group, this population is at high risk of severe COVID. We've seen the cases. They don't do so well. Even the progression of the disease tends to worsen in pregnant women than in non-pregnant women. So um, I'm highly recommending uh, pregnant women getting vaccinated. Clearly, though the data is limited on um, safety and whatnot, what is available is quite reassuring that these vaccines are safe. Um, that is the that is, uh, one. So pregnant women should be vaccinated, even breastfeeding ones um, uh, should, 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 should get vaccinated. That's the strongest, strongest thing. And I think the other appeal is with the high rising 
uh, numbers of deaths in the community, people dying at home, uh, it's an indication that for some reason there is a fear of coming to health facilities to seek care. And, and we really want to say we are here for, for you. Please come. Uh, and then and, and you'll, you'll have better chances, especially as indicated by Dr. Kipido, when symptoms of severity are setting in difficulty at when walking, difficulty when doing daily activities of life are setting in for those that are being managed as outpatients. Please come to, to hospital. So because clearly uh, we are not winning on that, on that score. All right, then, Madam First Lady, with the remaining few minutes, the floor is yours. Excellent, thank you. And I think I'll start with the doctors um, to just uh, finish off where Nilaro started. We've got exactly 10 minutes left, so I think it's two minutes um, each panelist. Dr. Cupido, and, and you've got a fantastic bedside manner. You've got this calming voice. Mm -hmm. I, I, <laughs> but if you could speak just a bit louder. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I would say um, thank you, uh, First Lady. Yes, we're all in this together. And we need to protect ourselves, protect each other, which means wear your mask, socially distance, don't go to gatherings, um, sanitize where you can, and above all, get yourself vaccinated. You know, we are not going to get out of this thing piecemeal. We're not going to get out of this thing one by one. We can't have our cake and eat it. We're either all in or we're all out. So please, do what you can, not just for yourself, but for, for everybody else as well. Otherwise, this, this, this hell will just continue. And we'll be sitting, if we're lucky, at the same place next year, talking about the same things, but with a much smaller audience. Sure. That's, I, I want to repeat that. If we're sitting, talking about the same things next year, we'll have a much smaller audience. I think that's, that's a stark reminder about what we're facing. Dr. Brevet? No, I, I would also like to start off with thanking you Mara, for this initiative because I think if we, we look where we started four weeks, six weeks ago um, at the rise of a pandemic, I think one can also have a bit of hope. Um, we're starting to see now in the hospitals that the, the bed occup occupancy is coming down, the new referrals is coming down. So we, we, we are managing, I mean, we're getting things right. Um, and I think as a, as a message I would like to um, add on to what, what Gordon just said is that we, we, we're all in this together. We have to trust the science. We have the opportunity to prevent f f progression of this. Um, and we, we have this opportunity and we should take it. I mean, as a, as a population, we should really stand together and, and um, remember that love protects and we need to protect it to protect each other um, by taking the vaccine and trusting the science. Yes. And how we can protect you guys who are doctors is by vaccinating. Mm. So you mm. and your families are protected, but that you don't have to see this carnage in your hospitals every day. Yeah, we, 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 we don't want to do this. I mean, mm. I think we, if you ask any of the doctors working on the front line, this is, we never thought we we're gonna be in a situation studying as a lung specialist. I, not in my wildest dreams thought I'm, I'm gonna be working in a pandemic. Um, with a primary respiratory disease. So we, d we don't want to be here. And yeah. we, we would like to ask the community to, to um, do their best to, to, to curb this disease. Thank you, Doctor. And, and thank both of you, because I know that you have such a long patient list of people that you are looking after. I'm sure your phones are ringing with your critical care patients. So for you to take time out to come and do this, I, I, I don't know how to thank you. Um, so thank you and, and everybody else. And, and Alka? Yeah, thank you. And thank you for having us here today. I think uh, this has been an excellent uh, session. And I'm so happy to be part of it. But before that, you know, it's not only thanking these doctors who have actually laid their lives out on the line, but all our healthcare workers, no matter what. And I mean, this is the kind of a feeling we should have to see to how we protect our own brothers, sisters, yep friends, family, everybody. And that's why vaccination is so very important. One other thing I would just like to add, people talk about livelihoods. We don't want lockdowns. We don't want, yes, we don't want lockdowns. We don't want economy shut. We are suffering. Vaccine hesitancy, vaccine delays, accessibility of vaccines is causing 
African countries a loss of 14 billion US dollars a month. These are our preliminary estimates. I mean, can we afford to continue like this? Don't we want our tourism to open up? Don't we want Namibia to get out of the red list? Don't we want to welcome tourists? Don't we want our industry to grow, thrive, our businesses to thrive, for us to lead normal lives? And the only way we can do it is vaccinate, 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 and keep on all or follow COVID appropriate behavior because it, the health of each one is the health for all of us. So we have, as I said, the individual and collective responsibility. And uh, there is, and everybody who can should come forward and strengthen the hands of the ministry, even in terms of this communication. And I think this is exactly where we are headed for. We know the ministry is overwhelmed. They are trying to put out whatever they can, but each one of us ha also has a responsibility to do our part. So love protects and let's do our part. Fantastic and powerful end. Thanks. Uh, Frederico? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, we, we all have to, my, my message would be sort of twofold. Firstly, um, uh, for, for health authorities, I mean, it should be the experts at the front communicating. It should not be left to people like me, journalists and so on, we, because we can get it wrong. We can misrepresent the, f the facts of the situation. Um, and if I have, I mean, I apologize if I've misrepresented any of the information here. Um, and I mean, so um, I would like to see more of that. I would like to see more the experts um, at the front communicating to the people. Um, um, and what I would also like to see, and I think this is where we should be headed, this is where other countries are headed, is comprehensive media and information literacy starting through the school system um, to address the, what we're seeing in terms of the information pollution um, and, and social media use. There really needs to be investment in that, in media and information literacy. Um, and then, then for the public, I mean, for, for everybody watching, I, I just like to say, don't, nobody, nobody wants to be the person who, who spams their friends and family and associates with lies, um, mm. you know, um, don't be that person. Don't be the person who, who spreads lies to friends and family and associates because it could have real world harmful consequences. It could, it could cost people, actually cost them their lives. Um, and I think this is, this is what's busy happening. Although we don't have the quantified uh, data on this, I suspect the, the lies and the falsehoods and the hoaxes and the conspiracy theories are costing people lives in this country. I think that's where we see the home death. I'm going to put my neck out there. That's, mm. that's where we see people not going to health services, self-medicating um, with, mm. with unapproved uh, medications. Um, that, that is disinformation. So please don't be that person. Don't be the person who spreads lies to your friends and, and family. Um, rather be the person who spreads verified information, who, who stops mm. When, when somebody is sharing something or forwarding something into your wa family WhatsApp group, rather be the person that takes the time to verify the information. Every question that has been asked here, there's an answer for that question, and that answer is available. Um, my, my first go-to is the World Health Organization's uh, uh, COVID-19 web pages. Every single question somebody can ask about the, the vaccines, mm -hmm. there's an answer there. They've answered these questions. They're simple, they're accessible, um, and, and, and if you have the data, go there. Verify the information before sharing, before forwarding. I be that person. Be that person, don't be that other person. Mm. And um, it can cost lives. And what everybody else is saying, that some of these deaths are preventable through vaccine, and we can prevent deaths as well through sharing the right information. And then I'd, um, if we could wrap up with you. Okay, thank you. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for having this uh, opportunity to be part of the panelists this evening. And uh, I would like to say that um, 
I'm so glad that I've been able to share about the uh, mental health and COVID-19. And maybe to wrap up, I have to say that um, uh, mental health and COVID-19, there is a, I can say a chicken and egg phenomena whereby mental health can lead to risk of someone to acquire infection of COVID-19 by maybe not being able to understand, to comprehend, or to abide to the rules and regulation for how to prevent themselves from uh, getting their COVID, I mean, corona infection and having COVID-19. But also it's the fact that there is a link between COVID-19 and mental health. And this can either be direct or indirectly through the psychological issues and poor coping skills about the whole issue of COVID-19. COVID-19 also can exacerbate or can precipitate the pre-existing mental disorders. And also, as I said earlier, the direct link now of COVID-19 and mental health, either because of the uh, physical manifestation of it and affect also the brain functionality and really to uh, mental health problems. So I would like also to say, um, let us also, there a lot have been done when it comes to physical management of COVID-19, but also let us put also our efforts on addressing the mental health issues when it comes to COVID-19. And that's important. Yes. And, and we've run out of time with that. We've, we've been at this for an hour and a half. It doesn't feel like that. Yeah. Um, and all I can say is thank you to each one of you. It's thank been you. such an exceptional platform to hear each one of your expertise. And I agree with Frederico. We must listen to the experts. You, you know exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. I, I want to thank Dr. Swami, uh, Swami Nathan from uh, WHO. I want to thank each and every one of you and, and everybody who's participated on this platform. We're taking it fully Facebook from now. We're not going to be doing the NBC live sessions. So I want to take this opportunity to thank NBC for just fantastically and professionally managing these Love Protect conversations. Blanche, you're a superstar. I don't know how to thank you. Um, for the manner that you've engaged this. And to all of the other experts that have been part of this panel, thank you very much. There's so many of you, I can't mention you by names. And in two weeks' time, we'll have a Facebook Live. It won't be live on NBC. We will be dealing with some of the issues around the economy. Um, later, we'll talk about how it impacts people with HIV. And then we'll have a youth town hall. So th the programs will continue, just not on NBC. And thank you to you, the viewers, for your many questions, for your engagement. We're very grateful. Love protects. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Dumelang Manamibia Amanke Lina Lame Kimpo Slinger Kimurla Kanye Woman Naneo Abu Joko Mulifaping La Bujoko Munamibia Mukhari Wa COVID nineteen Kimachusezi Hu Batu Boke Mulifatsi Hu Akariza Na Lewena Ari Tuseng Lifapa La Bujoko Hukakwa Faza Kanamisho Ya Mukhari Wa COVID nineteen Okona, Kutsaya Mukento, Ugatusa Milewahahu, Kulwan Samuhare, Milhone, Mukento Unale Mushula U Latelang. Fawi Kentile, Ukile Hukanali Mushula Wahuri, Usika Ubona, Bulwezi Juma Sisi, Ukleho Fukutsa Jalo, Sebaga Sahuru Utsene Mobu Okelo, Milhone Hufukutsa Tirahalo Ya Lusho. Kato ingwe e ukana hukai zaya kichosa anamisi melaiza e singya niti mababi limuhare wa COVID-19 kana melaiza e limuhare e kachano dimaitiko alifapa la puto hom kubuto kahore ritualle hukai para jalo si tibelejo saruna hukapa diaga saruna mele hone hui kapa jalo muti pute hongjaka di piko manyalo na le siyabe mo go lwantseng mo gare wa covid 19 tsaya mo kento wa gago supa lorato o sireletse ba eleng gore wa barata le ba eleng gore ba gaufi le wena na ke setse ke tseile mo kento wa me khatlanong le covid 19 dira karolo ya gago Mew eats a little rat or a little